King Triple C here. If you guys want to make the best MMA picks and predictions, go follow Lucrative MMA Betting and get the winners and results. Do it now or bend the knee. What is up, people? Welcome to another edition of the Lucrative MMA Betting Show. This week is a big, big pay-per-view with John Jones facing Stipe Miocic for the heavyweight title. I thought we was never going to get the fight, but eventually the old boys are swinging it out for the most coveted title in MMA. I'm excited to bring these picks and predictions to you and hopefully, as always, we can make some money this week and take the bookies for all they have. Make sure you stick around to the end of this video because I'm debuting a fun new segment where I'm gonna give away one free month of an elite membership to my VIP betting group to one lucky viewer and it might be you. As I said last week, we stay leveling up the content game. And as is a pay-per-view week, I wanted to do something special. So without further ado, let's get into the breakdowns. So at the top of the bill, we got John Bones Jones, the greatest fighter in MMA history versus Stipe Miocic. John Jones has a record of 27, one and zero. And that's from Tapology, but I think that might be wrong because I've heard from the great grapevine that the one loss on his record is actually being overturned. That was way back in 2009, where he lost the fight from illegal downward elbows. But if you've been following MMA, you know that that rule has just changed and it's actually legal to throw those elbows now. So hit it with the John Jones, he ran. <laughs> hit it with the John Jones. <laughs> He's right there. I heard that they're overturning that record. So in reality, John Jones will have a record of 28 and 0. On the other hand, we got Stipe Miocic with a stellar record of 20 wins and four losses. Currently, they have John Jones as a massive minus 700 favorite with Stipe Miocic having an underdog price of plus 500. Boys, I'm not gonna bore you with this one. This fight comes down to how Stipe Miocic looks. I mean, we still don't know how John Jones is gonna perform up at heavyweight. I do understand that, right? He's only had one fight at heavyweight. It was over very quickly against someone who just was so outmatched in the grappling. So, you know, there is a chance that we still don't know if John Jones is gonna perform well at heavyweight, if his cardio holds up, et cetera, et cetera. But the main question in this fight is not about John Jones, which is kind of ironic. The main question in this fight is really about Stipe Miocic. How is he looking? How is he gonna look at heavyweight at 42 years of age? How is he gonna look after four years out of the sport? How is he gonna look coming back, not only after four years, but after getting nuked by Francis and Garnu? I personally don't think he's gonna look good, boys. I've seen some footage of him training over the last four years. He looks stiff, he looks wooden, he looks like he's lost a touch athletically, physically, and it's obviously hard to tell when the training footage I've seen of him is just hitting pads or working out in the gym. It's not actual fight footage, but I trust my eye and I don't think he's up to scratch anymore, boys. I honestly think that he could show a really, really poor performance here. Now, if he comes back as the Stipe Miocic that even fought Francis Ngannou in their last fight or any fight before that, he can make this a fight against John Jones. He's a real heavyweight. He's been at heavyweight for his entire career. Like I said, we still don't know how John's gonna perform at heavyweight. And you know, Stipe could make it close with the boxing and maybe some anti-grappling, but that's if Stipe is St the Stipe of five years ago. I can't trust him to be that. I don't think any normal human can trust Stipe to come back in any type of form. Whereas at least with John Jones, we've seen him compete within the last two years. Not only that, but he competed well. It was a complete domination against someone, again, who is a true heavyweight. And although he didn't have any grappling to defend the submission of Jones, we still can't take away the performance completely from John Jones coming back after three years, stepping up in weight class and fighting one of the scariest guys in the division, at least physically, at least athletically. Yes, Cyril Gunn doesn't have a lot of power. He's not got a lot of KOs, although he does have a few in the UFC. He's still very, very skillful. He's minus 300 against Alexander Volkov in a December card. So, you know, he's still rated in the heavyweight division. So it's definitely a good look for John Jones to run through him like that. And so, yeah, I'm picking John Jones here. I'm not gonna go too more in depth with the breakdown. I think though, stylistically, John Jones can obviously compete on the feet. Stipe Miocic is mainly a boxer. John Jones has an iron chin, a rock chin. He's never been dropped. He's been wobbled a couple of times in the UFC. You know, Cormier hit him a few times. Gustafsson had some good shots. Obviously, Dominic Reyes punched him in the chest and dropped him, but that's not really a knockdown in my books. 
And at the end of the day, Stipe's best weapon is his boxing and his punching. So he's going up against an iron chin guy in John Jones here. So outside of that, I honestly don't see what Stipe has to offer. John Jones is better with the elbows, better with the knees, better with the kicks, better in all realms of striking outside of pure boxing. But John never fights in pure boxing range. John is always on the outside or on the inside with the clinched knees. He's never fighting in pure boxing range. It's very, very rare he does that. If you round out more of the MMA game, he's a much better grappler. He's a much better wrestler. He's a way better wrestler. People are going to sit here and tell you that Stipe's a better wrestler. John Jones will dump Stipe on his ass a million times over if they wrestle, especially MMA wrestling. MMA wrestling is very, very different than normal wrestling, no matter what the wrestling aficionados will say. It's a completely different ball game because you can threaten with front chokes. To, you can use the cage, which is a completely different thing. Uh, a lot of times wrestlers, when they're taken down, they don't know what to do off their back. They haven't got great jiu-jitsu so yeah maybe they can stuff the first takedown but you get what I'm trying to say John Jones is the far better wrestler in this matchup the better MMA wrestler and the better MMA, MMA grappler I think John Jones can win whatever way he wants and yeah I do I will say that it is predicated on Stipe coming back looking a shell of himself which I am predicting him to do and sometimes that is hard to predict but after four years off and at 42 years old I think it's almost a no-brainer I'm taking John Jones to win here I'm taking John Jones to win inside the distance here and I'm taking John Jones to win within the first two rounds after the fight, he's going to call out Alex Pereira. I don't think he's going to fight Tom Aspinall. He's probably going to fight Alex Pereira, grapple him, beat him, go down as the best fighter in history, which I do believe is the case. But I don't believe beating Alex Pereira and Stipe Miocic adds a huge deal of credibility to his case. I believe that the Tom Aspinall fight would add a much bigger deal of credibility. And the reason for that is because Aspinall is a way tougher matchup and a way better fighter than both of those guys. But we all know that, right? The entire MMA media knows that. I still don't want to take anything away from John Jones. It's my personal belief that he's the greatest mixed martial arts fighter to ever grace the sport. And I think he proves that once again this weekend. Okay, next fight on the card, we have Charles Oliveira versus Michael Chandler. Now, this is a rematch of a banger of a fight that happened way back in 2021. It was actually when Charles Oliveira won the belt and went on his historic run. Charles Oliveira is coming into this matchup with a veteran record of 34 wins and 10 losses. Michael Chandler's coming in with another veteran record of 23 wins and eight losses. Currently, we've got Charles Oliveira, the big favorite at minus 275, with the underdog price coming back on Michael Chandler at plus 225. Now, the first thing I thought when I saw this line was that the line might be predicated on recency bias. And like I always say, boys, I'm not an MMA analyst, although I do analyze MMA. I am an MMA sports better. And there is a big, big difference between picking somebody to win and betting on who you think is going to make you more money in the long run. Picking a winner and picking a bet are not the same things. So while I do think that Charles Oliveira has the edge in this matchup, I also think that the line is a little bit too wide in his favor. It wasn't that hard to do tape study for this fight. And it's funny I say that because I actually want to research this fight a lot more. So I'm not going to give a concrete prediction right now. As always, my predictions change throughout the week. And that's why you should be signed up to my service, lucrativemmabetting.com, if you really want to get my full picks and predictions. Because as I said, they change throughout the week and after this video. Like I said on the last video, if I get enough comments on this video, I will bring back the Parlay Madness stream where a lot of my final takes will be. It's a big pay-per-view week, so I'm thinking of bringing the stream back. If you do want to see that stream, again, let me know in the comments. I was actually thinking of doing it last week, but some life got in the way. So let me know how you feel about this week and maybe I go live on a Friday or Saturday. But back to the fight. Yeah, I do want to do a little bit more tape, but I've already done some research and it wasn't hard because I went back and I watched Charles Oliveira's first fight of Michael Chandler. And that's what everybody should be doing before they're making a bet on this fight, right? Because you want to know how the fight has performed against each other. It's not often we get rematch matches in the UFC. It's not often we have data like this to work on when we are betting on fights. If you want to know how two fighters match up, we have to guess, right? We have to make predictions on how they're going to match up. In this fight, we don't have to make that much predictions. We don't have to guess because they've already fought together. Of course, the fight's not going to go the same way. No two fights are ever the same, but it's definitely a lot of good data we have to use. So when I went back and watched that first fight, it was very interesting to me to see that Chandler almost finished Charles Oliveira in that round one. He got a 10-8 on a couple of the judges' scorecards and smashed Charles Oliveira, almost finished him near the end of the round. He also had his back taken in that fight by Charles Oliveira, the best submission fighter 
the sport has ever seen at least top three and definitely the fight with the most submissions in UFC history and he didn't look ever in danger he shrugged him off he actually slammed him out of the back take I remember Chandler coming out after the fight and saying people were telling him not to slam Charles if he has him on his back because he may be able to cling on and then you've given up a back position on the mat but Chandler is so f athletic that he did it anyway and was able to spin out shortly after. Chandler competed well in that fight man. The issue is that Chandler is very fragile specifically with his chin and he gets hurt a lot. Basically every fight he has ever fought he got hurt. Gaethje rocked him badly. Poirier rocked him badly. Oliveira rocked him badly. Even Ferguson stunned him at one point. Tony Ferguson, the corpse of Tony Ferguson. So this guy is getting hurt, dropped, wobbled in every single fight that he's fought and he eventually got finished. But you know what guys? The exact same thing is happening for Charles Oliveira. So if we look back at Charles Oliveira's career, especially his recent run, the guy is getting wobbled all over the place by Justin Gaethje, dropped by Gaethje, wobbled by Poirier, dropped by Makachev, dropped by Chandler, almost finished. I mean, it's like a mirror matchup in that these guys both hurt their opponents in every fight, but both get hurt in every fight. Now the big difference is Charles Oliveira is coming out with the wins in those fights that he's getting hurt in, in those fights that he's getting dropped and wobbled in. And Chandler is coming out with the L almost every single time. I mean, shout out to Chandler for making these fights competitive, but the truth of the matter is that he's got one win in the last four years, and that win is the corpse of Tony Ferguson during one of the worst UFC runs we have ever seen in the history of the sport. So that win doesn't tell me anything. He's actually been a lot more impressive in some of his losses than he has in that win against Tony Ferguson. Now boys, at the end of the day, if fights are volatile, the guy you think is gonna get the win is not gonna keep on getting the win. So what I mean by that is, I just told you that Charles Oliveira has these 50-50 fights, volatile fights where he's getting hurt, his opponents are getting hurt, anybody could win in the moment, right? But he's always coming out with the win. And I said Chandler's the opposite. He's having these 50-50 fights, but he's coming out with a loss. But that doesn't mean that that's gonna happen for the rest of their career. I mean, if you're getting into these wars, if you're getting dropped, wobbled, hurt, you're not gonna keep on pulling out the win, right? Something's gotta give at some point. And you know, you could argue that it did in Charles Oliveira's fight against Makachev. He got wobbled, he got hurt, and finally got submitted. So just because Charles has been getting these wins in these 50-50 fights previously, doesn't mean he's gonna get the win this weekend. I honestly think that Michael Chandler has a good shot of getting the win against Charles Oliveira, but I have to pick Charles Oliveira to get the win. He's got more tools to get it done, right? He's a better striker by far. He's got way more tools. He's brutal in the clinch. He's brutal at every range. He's got very good sharp boxing, whereas Chandler's got more looping hooks. I can imagine a world in which Chandler's looping the hooks, but Olives comes down the middle with a lot of the straight shots that he throws and he's able to chin Chandler that way. So at boxing range, he has an advantage. At long range, he has an advantage with his kicks and his vicious teeps. In close range, he has a massive advantage with his elbows, his clinched knees. I can imagine him getting the tire plumb here and just ripping the body, going to work with knees and elbows. And then on the ground, he has an advantage as well, you know, in his submission grappling. But Chandler has an advantage in power, in explosivity, in wrestling. And just the way Chandler fights, man, he's an absolute cannon. It doesn't matter who he fights, he always has a chance of knocking them unconscious. And he almost did it in their first fight. So I think plus 225 odds on Chandler are disrespectful. But I will pick Charles Oliveira to win the fight outright, just because he's got more tools to do it and he's the better overall fighter. But, you know, something else to note is that if Chandler wins this fight, he's... He, He's in the title shot again, you know, he's in a title shot picture. And he will know that going in. He also wants revenge on Charles Oliveira. Charles has been there, he's done it, he's won the title before, and the mental aspect of the fight game is something that is not spoken about a lot in betting terms, but let me tell you, it impacts betting terms a lot. Not every single time, but we have to take the mental aspect in as well. And, you know, it seems to me that Chandler's gonna be the one a little bit more motivated for this fight. And if not more motivated for this fight, definitely more motivated for title aspirations. You know, I'm very confident in saying that because he's never been a champion. That is a burning desire for him. Whereas once you achieved it, it's not as burning a desire for you anymore, right? The second time, becoming a second time champ, a two time champ, it's never gonna be the same desire as the first time champ. So that is also something to note here. So long story short, boys, I'm picking Charles Oliveira to win. 
but I may look at a bet on Michael Chandler or maybe Michael Chandler via KO because I definitely don't think he's winning the decision here um, or Chandler inside the distance or, or something like that. I'm going to look at the odds. I'm going to actually do some more research. As I said, I want to see their recent fights a little bit more and yeah, make my prediction. It is worth noting as well that Tapology says that this fight is a five rounder. In my opinion, that favours Charles Oliveira heavily. I think he's got much better gas tank than Michael Chandler and I feel like over the course of five rounds, Chandler would probably get hurt and wobbled a little bit more than Charles Oliveira and Oliveira's tools do better well later into the fight. So that's also why I'm picking Oliveira. But next fight up, we got Bo Nickel, the potential future of MMA versus Paul Craig, an absolute legend in the game. You gotta love Paul Craig. So currently Bo Nickel has a shiny 6-0 record versus the unshiny record of the Bear Jew Paul Craig at 17-8-1. Currently Bo Nickel is the biggest favorite on the card and one of the biggest favorites we've had in many, many months at minus 1,000 with a comeback underdog price tag of Paul Craig at plus 600. This won't be a long breakdown for me guys obviously Bo Nickel is the minus 1000 favorite meaning that he should get the win meaning that I also agree with the bookies I do think he will win this fight he has the wrestling to dictate where the fight goes which obviously is always good when you're fighting Paul Craig because he is a very very good submission grappler I mean he finished Ankalaev, Krylov and Jamal Hill, which are some high, high level wins. And he finished all of them on the ground. So if you can keep it standing with him, it's probably a better idea. Now, it's interesting because Bo is a full-time wrestler, right? Like he probably will shoot takedowns here, but that's not a guarantee. You know, Bo strikes me as someone who's smart, who knows what he's doing now. I will say that just because he's a full-time wrestler, he might just divert into the, the grappling. He might just shoot a takedown just because that's what he's been doing his entire life. If he does shoot a takedown, although it probably won't be the best decision, he can still win from there. I can imagine Bo shooting a takedown and honestly dominating from top position. Now, he has to be careful of the triangles. Paul Craig has a very, very solid guard. You know, he's got a very good triangle, got a very good triangle armbar. And it's not out of the realm of possibility that Bo gets caught in something like that. So, you know, if you're a degenerate like me and you want to take a little shot on Paul Craig via submission at massive odds, Paul Craig via submission in round one at probably even more insane odds, then, you know, be my guest. I don't think I'm going to do it personally, although it really does depend on what odds they give me. But overall, I feel like Bo is probably going to stay safe on top. So even in Paul Craig's most dangerous realm, which is most likely the ground here, I still think Bo is going to win that fight. I think more often than not, if Bo's smart, he'll keep the fight on the feet and knock Paul Craig out on the feet. Paul Craig's not a good striker. He is long. He is rangy. But I don't think nothing that Bo hasn't seen before in terms of the technicality and the striking. I think Bo has very good power in his right hand. And I think he'll be able to come with some type of right hook or right overhand over the top of Paul Craig's guard catch him and knock him out you know and if he doesn't he'll probably be able to slam him on his head and knock him out from top position he might even be able to wear him down and get an arm triangle or something like that Paul Craig has been submitted uh, multiple times so yeah my prediction surprise surprise is the minus 1000 favorite Bo Nickel gets it done I think he gets it done inside the distance I think it's probably round one as well to be honest the next fight on the card is Kareem Silva versus Vivian Araujo. We've got Kareem Silva coming in with the 18 and 4 record, facing the fellow Brazilian Vivian Araujo, who has a 12 and 6 record. Currently, they've got Kareem Silva with a minus 275 price tag, and Vivian Araujo coming back with the underdog price tag of plus 225. So, the same price as the fight between Charles Oliveira and Michael Chandler. And you know, it's funny because Charles Oliveira and Kareem Silva have the same price tag, but I don't think that that should be the case. You know, I think Kareem Silva has a much better chance of winning the fight against Vivian Araujo this weekend than Charles Oliveira does have against Michael Chandler. But yet, they're the exact same odds. And, you know, that's why I think we are able to make money from this game because those two fights, they shouldn't be the same odds, but they are. And that's where we have an edge in the game. Now, I could be wrong this specific time, but how many times do we see minus 400 favorites like Renat Fakradinov going to split decisions and then we see minus 400 favorites completely dominate. That's why we can make money in this game because of the odds. It's not about who you think is going to win. It's because the odds are off and we have to take advantage of those odds. A little rant, but let me get back to it. Kareem Silva should win this fight. You know, I do think that she's going to be able to get takedowns on Vivian Araujo here, but I'm actually not sure it plays out like that. I think Araujo might be the one shooting takedowns just because she does in every fight. And I think Kareem Silva can snap up some type of front choke or maybe take the back after a failed shot from Araujo. You know, I envision a scenario where they get into grappling and Silva just has the better BJJ, the sharper BJJ, the faster, the more sneaky submission game, reversal game, and she gets the upper hand of the grappling that way. I don't know if she's going to come out shooting takedowns here, although I do think she has the ability to get them. When we speak about the striking, I think Silva, although she isn't a great striker, 
she can negate her fighters tools on the feet quite well she did it to Lipsky quite well you know when they was on the feet she did well at negating that and then she just won the fight via takedowns and Lipsky's a much better striker than Arahujo in my opinion I think Kareem Silva can land a solid overhand here you know she's knocked down a couple of girls in the UFC already I think she can honestly get another knockdown here Arahujo gets tagged Arahujo gets hurt a lot I remember the Andre Lee fight she got kicked badly hurt badly Silva's on a trajectory at the moment you know she's on a massive upwards trajectory and I feel like that is going to get her the win if they fought four or five years ago I do think the fight will be closer than probably it will be this weekend. I feel like we've seen Averhujo get worse and worse over the recent years. You know, at one point she was making somewhat of a run, but then her issues started to come to the light, like getting dropped by girls with not really big power, gassing out badly in certain third rounds. And I just think she's on a downwards trajectory and Karine Silva is on an upwards trajectory. And I think that that, for the most part, is gonna get Karine Silva the win here. And I actually think that she can get this one done inside the distance. Now, if she doesn't get it inside the distance, it could potentially be close. It could be like a 29-28, but I just think that more often than not, Silver's gonna do what it takes to get the win. Even if the fight looks close, most likely Silver will always do enough. And that's what I like to call illusion of value. So I do believe that Arujo has some illusion of value this weekend. But yeah, I'm picking Karine Silver to get the win. According to Tapology, there is one more fight on the main card, Mauricio Ruffy versus James Lomtop. This is a shorter notice matchup. So we've got Mauricio Ruffy coming in with a 10 and one record and James Lomtop coming in with a 14 and four record. Now there's massive hype on Mauricio Ruffy at the moment and he's coming in as a minus 800 favorite with the underdog price on James Lomtop being plus 550. Now I have to be fully honest with you guys, I have not done tape study for this fight yet, so I cannot talk too in depth about this fight. Again, obviously all my official predictions and breakdowns for all of the main card fights and all of the prelim fights will be up on my website, but for now I'll just give you a pre-tape study breakdown. So it's a very top line breakdown. Mauricio Ruffi, the first thing I think about this fight is that the price is crazy. I know both fighters well. I actually bet on Mauricio Ruffi against Jamie Malarkey and I bet on him as an underdog in his contender series fight. So two fights under the UFC banner, two times I've bet on him. And I can tell you right now, I will not be betting on him this weekend. I will be hopping off the train. Minus 800 seems kind of crazy in a fight that should be a striking affair where James Lontop is a decent striker. I know he lost against Borshev, but in my opinion, he put up a good fight against him. And Borshev is a good striker in his own right. Now, Ruffy is a bit better with the range management. Definitely seems a lot tougher, better chin. But it's very easy for me to see that this price tag is purely based on hype. Minus 800 is ridiculous. He's minus 800 because he just did a scissor sweep in his last fight and he went viral over social media. Minus 800 is because everyone is calling him the new Conor McGregor because the way he bounces in and out of range. That's why he's minus 800. He ain't minus 800 because the true line is he's gonna win this fight 88% of the time or whatever minus 800 indicates. So straight off the bat, I know for a fact that this line is based on recency bias. And honestly, that's one of the best spots you can be in in MMA betting is when you're fading recency bias. Does it mean I'm gonna bet on James Lontop? I don't know, I'm gonna do tape research, but I definitely think James Lontop can make this fight close at points, but Ruffy does have big finishing upside here. He is very dynamic, so you know he can catch you with a flying knee or a spinning wheel kick or a, a brutal elbow or like a spinning back fist combo like Shara Bullet did the other day. And those fighters are dangerous, man. Those fighters are dangerous. But let's not act like Ruffy is gonna be the greatest fighter of all time or a definite future UFC champion. It wasn't too long ago where he was getting knocked out by Manuel Souza. He's not this undefeated beast who's dominated everyone with grappling and striking, etc., etc. I don't really see how he deserves to be minus 800. But that's gonna be the breakdown for today because as I said, I haven't done tape study on these guys. So mate, who knows? Maybe I watch tape and I go, oh, I know why he's minus 800. I highly doubt it because I do know these fighters, like even if I'm calling him to win, it probably won't be more than a minus 300 or something. But yeah, I'll pick Ruffy to win before doing research. I do think he will get the win here, but I don't think he should be minus 800. And boys, now we have come to the most fun segment, the giveaway segment. So I got the idea to do this when I was reminiscing on my time in Las Vegas, playing my favorite slot machine, the Wheel of Fortune. I made a lot of money off that machine and I had a lot of fun spinning the Wheel of Fortune. So I thought, why not bring a lucrative Wheel of Fortune to you and give away a gift to the people I love, my viewers, my commenters, my supporters, my subscribers. 
So everybody who has commented on my last video has been automatically put onto the Wheel of Fortune with a chance to win one free month of my elite service. Now, if the person who wins has already signed up to my service, well, then I'm gonna give you an extra free month or the money equivalent sent straight to your bank account. So if you wanna be in with a chance to win in the future, and we will be doing this very often in the future, maybe every episode, then make sure you comment down below on all of our episodes and you will be in with a chance to win on the next draw. Oh, and you have to like and subscribe to be entered as well. Make sure you do that. Okay, so here we go, boys. We're gonna spin the wheel. I don't know who's gonna win, so this is gonna be fun. You're gonna watch it with me in real time. All right, let's go, boys. It's spinning. Who's gonna win? Slowing down. Oh, Tristan. No, Triways. Congratulations, Triways at Triways. You just won one month free of the lucrative MMA betting elite zone. You can DM me on Twitter at Lucrative James. You can DM me on Instagram at Lucrative James and I'll sort you out. If anyone tries to DM me pretending to be Triways, don't worry, I already have his YouTube profile. Very easy for me to find out, so don't waste your time. That's illegal. So that's it, boys. The breakdown is done for the day. The giveaway is done for today. I hope you enjoyed the breakdown. Hopefully, it's gonna help you make some money this weekend on a banger of a pay-per-view card. Before you click off my channel, I just released a great new video with Jeremy Kennedy, former Bellator title challenger, where I went, spent a day with him, trained with him, worked out with him, and got a good chat in. So if you wanna watch that, you can click the video right here. And that's it, boys. Make sure you go to lucrativemmabetting.com if you wanna get all of my official picks, predictions, long shot parlays, long shot props, my full card breakdowns with all the prelim fights, etc., etc. And that's it, boys. Until the next video, peace.